Welcome to this exclusive teaching series from Dr. Trim entitled Hello Tomorrow. This is actually the final session in the six part series and we know that you've been impacted by this message and we hope that, that after you're, you're done that you would have written a vision for the next 20 years of your life. And we wanna continue on with this journey with you. Uh, connect with us on social media at Cindy Trim on Twitter and Instagram and at Dr. Trim on Facebook. And hey, we wanna see you at one of our live annual events, either Kingdom School of Ministry, which is in the middle of the year, a week-long ministry intensive training from the Trim Institute for Global Leadership, or you can join us at End Your Year Strong Empowerment Summit at the end of the year. And I say or, but I really mean and, because you need to be at both of those events, as, as those who have attended before would testify. But we're going to end tonight on a, on a high, and I know that Dr. Trim has a word for you to wrap up this series. Would you all put your hands together and welcome Dr. Cindy Trim. I am super, super charged. I'm super, super charged by my life group and my Bible study group and my own book club here in Atlanta. And I know those of you that are meeting around the world are excited about this amazing book, Hello Tomorrow. It's about trans the transformational power of vision. And it's so weighty, it's so heavy. And uh, I want to jump directly into our teachings so that we can really excavate um, our text and give you some more nuggets and encourage you to pick up a copy of the book and start your own book club. It's fantastic. And those of us that have been meeting in my book club and in uh, our life group, we have had a time. And the presence of God has been here in every session and I'm excited about it. So we're in part six, and I want to turn your attention to, attention to Numbers chapter 12, verse 6, and Ezekiel 11, 24 to 25, and our text is going to come from there. The scripture says, and he said, Hear now my words, if there be a prophet among you, I, the Lord, will make known myself unto him in a vision, and will speak unto him in a dream. Ezekiel 11, 24, 25 says, Afterward, the Spirit took me up and brought me in a vision by the Spirit of God into Chaldea, to them of captivity. So the vision that I had seen went up from me. Then I spoke unto them of the captivity of all the things that the Lord had showed me. And so God, God is raising up visionaries in our generation, individuals, and groups of individuals that he's going to use to push humanity forward. So let's continue to talk about what a vision is. A vision is a heavenly pattern given to man who causes it to become a reality within a specific time, generation, duration, and a space in history. Within a time, a generation, duration, and a space in history. And this is important because Usually, visionaries are history makers. They're history makers. Hebrews said in Hebrews 8 and 5, who serve under, unto the example and shadow of heavenly things as Moses was at, admonished of God when he was about to make the tabernacle. For see, saith he, that thou make all things according to the pattern showed to thee in, in, in the mountain. So we are presented with Moses in the book of Hebrews who was a visionary that God showed him how to build a tabernacle. Up until this, this point, there was no such thing as a tabernacle. Nobody has, had ever built a tabernacle. And so God gave him a vision to push um, the spiritual life of Israel, Israel forward by um, building the tabernacle that would represent the presence of God and give them a tangible place where they could meet God and to bring praises and bring their offering. And so if we go back into Exodus chapter 25, starting from verse number one, we can see the things that God had spoken to him and how this actually unfolded. So verse number 25, and it reads, this is verse number one to nine. 
It says, and the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they bring me an offering of every man that giveth it willingly. With his heart ye shall take my offering. And so he was not just willy-nilly willy asking for an offering. He had a vision. And then he was in, encouraging people to be a part of this vision and help him to bring this vision to pass. And then God gave him the instructions to tell them, anyone that is willing... Bring an offering, and this is the offering which you shall take of them, gold, silver, brass, blue, purple, scarlet, fine linen, goat hair, ram skin dyed in red, badger skin, shittim wood, oil for the light, spices up for the anointing oil, and sweet incense, onyx stones, stones to be set in ephod in the breastplate, and let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them according to all that I showed thee after the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. And so we understand that Moses was able to build a tabernacle. He knew what to ask for by way of an offering that he would receive from those that were willing. So it, within any congregation, there might be individuals that are not willing. So we should not use manipula manipulative strategies in order to, to receive offerings. God will always place individuals within a congregation that has the responsibility and has the anointing and has the assignment to underwrite that vision. And he not only will do it with uh, congregations, but he would do it with nonprofit organizations. You know, when when businesses and, and, and companies go public, a lot of them have to really raise capital. So the church is not the only people that are raising capital for their vision. You have Fortune 500 companies. You have major corporations throughout the world. You have countries that actually raise offerings, quote unquote, but it's the raising of capitals to advance their vision. One of the one of the countries, the modern countries now is Dubai. Dubai has an amazing vision, but all of the resources, the economic and financial resources didn't come from Dubai nor their government's coffer. It came from countries from around the world where they were able to pitch their vision and then they gave towards the vision and this is how they build sufficient capital to bring their vision vision to pass. Dubai was just a struggling desert place where they would gr go hungry, where crops wouldn't grow. And this is within my generation. And now they're, they're, they're rising up and uh, it is the go-to place now for the rich and the famous. Um, right in the desert, you would not believe what they have built, the most beautiful buildings, the most beautiful um, uh, uh, um, malls. Everything is beautiful uh, there. But it took the vision of a previous generation to be able to say, we can be the uh, destination. Um, and this is not just vacation de destination. They have a vision to be the number one tour medical tourism. They want to be the number one medical tourism brand where people from around the world come and they get facelift and they get other uh, kinds of procedures. They have a vision to be the number one in the world, not the United States of America, not Japan, not Singapore, not Great Britain, not Europe, but they have a vision and their vision is to be the number one. Raise your hands right now. Our Father and our God, I give you praise and honor and glory. You are downloading into our spirit a revelation right now. Hallelujah. Visions that will transform our nation. And I give you praise that we will capture this vision. We will write it down and we will begin to execute it. I thank you for this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just as I was standing, I was born in Bermuda. I've been living in the United States of America for about 30 years. But I, you know, I, I was born in Bermuda and as I was speaking about Dubai, God just downloaded a vision. And I saw as I was standing, it was a vision that showed up like a sheet, like a sheet uh, of paper that came right before my eyes as I was speaking to you, as, as I was ministering this word. And I, God gave me a vision for Bermuda and how to push Bermuda forward because I had been praying and praying and praying and I'm excited about it because I'm going to be a part of the unfolding of God's plan for my island nation. 
And not only my island nation, you know I love United States of America and I have a vision for the United States of America. And I'm so glad that I'm born in this generation with modern technology. I'm so happy about it. Amen. But God told, God told uh, Moses, this is what I want you to build. And based on that particular vision, he knew uh, what resources he needed. And a lot of us don't know what resources we, we need because we're praying and asking uh, God, but we're not asking according to a vision, you know, and we're not doing things according to vision. Um, I shared with you, I went to Harvard, I went to Oxford, not because I just wanted to get a training through Oxford and through Harvard, but because it's a part of the vision that God has given me for the future, what he's called me to do and what he's called me to build. And so everything that I'm doing is as a result of, of being a visionary. And so it is with you and so it will be with your children. Let's look at another text, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verses 11 to 12. The Bible said, then David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern of the porch and of the house thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers thereof and of the inner parlors thereof and of the place of the mercy seat and the pattern of all that he had by the spirit um, of the courts of the house of the Lord and of all the chambers round about and of the treasuries of the house of God and of the treasuries of the dedicated things. So God gave him a vision. So he wasn't just building or trying to duplicate another building that he saw around. God actually showed him all of the specifications of this building and he was able to communicate it, articulate it to his son. You've got to be able to articulate what God is doing with you to another generation, whether it's your sons and your daughters, whether it's a business that you want to send down, whether it's as simple as an inheritance or a trust. You will be able to say, I'm leaving this money, uh, I'm leaving it in trust, I'm leaving this building, I'm leaving this piece of property, I'm going to leave it in trust, and this is what I want done with this. And so these are individuals uh, that God is going to raise up in our generation that is going to build trust and is going to be fantastic for you and your family. Now, let's look at the next point, visions. Visions are powerful spiritual motivators. So uh, this man named Mr. Wilson, he said, the power of vision derives from its ability to capture the hearts and the minds of an organization's members by setting forth a goal that is both feasible and uplifting. It can reinforce the empowerment that most organizations today seek to promote. It, focus, it, it focuses thought and action, providing both the readiness and the aim, as in ready, aim, and fire, for strategic and tactical decisions, helping to ensure consistency in the decision-making. It is the star by which the organization stares. Now, he said this about organization, and he likens an, uh, uh, your vision to being a motivator. It just motivates you, and it just points you in the right direction. So some people know they have to change some people know that they want different. They want to move forward. They want to move their business. They want to move their organization, their family. They want to move their companies forward, but they lack the motivation to change. And what will give you the motivation is your vision. So let's face it. Change is not an easy task. Whether uh, you or someone else attempts to change, let's take dieting. That's not easy. Let's take exercising. That's not easy. We know we have to do it, but but it's hard, so it requires motivation. And you know, a lot of times we have that feeling that something is stopping us or, or we don't have that something that we need to move forward. And that something, I'm going to put a word to it, is motivation. But I, I just don't want to talk about motivation. There was um, uh, the, the two um, PhDs uh, that developed a model. One was James and the other was Carlo. And they were PhD students. Uh, 
uh, Prokaska, and I hope I'm not messing up the name, but Prokaska, and he was a PhD, James Prokaska and Carlo De Clemente, and they were both PhDs, and they, they, did, they did develop, this is, the late in the, this is late in the 70s, they developed this model to help people to understand how to be motivated. So they developed the five stages or the six stages of motivation. Number one, that's the pre-contemplation. That's when, 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 when you're in this stage, you're aware that you need to change, but you haven't made a decision. Uh, you haven't compared the emotional, the spiritual, um, social benefits of it, the financial benefits of it. You just know, know uh, that you have to change. But the second stage is contemplation. Now you're thinking about changing. The third stage is preparation. Now you're going to prepare. The fourth stage is, is action. And the fifth stage is maintenance. And then finally, the sixth stage is termination, where things have, have uh, you, you know, you're t terminated, you're in this position where your behavior is consistent, it is now a lifestyle, and that you are no longer reacting to um, temptation, and you're confident, you're enjoying self-control, you're enjoying your life, you're appreciating a health, you're in happy life. This is when you have termination. But then you hit the reset button, and you start all over, because there is is something else you need to do. And so because change is frequent, we're going to go, it's going to be like a cycle you know, that it's going to happen. Here you are working on one aspect of your vision, and then you work in another aspect of your vision, and it's going to happen over and over. And then when you get to a point where you're happy and you're healthy, God is going to download another facet of that vision, and then you're going to have to be motivated over and over again. And I think about my life. I think about when I started 20, 22, 23 years ago writing visions. And now uh, two to three years ago, um, writing another vision because the statue of limitation had run, run out. I had fulfilled everything. I started a new vision. And um, I thought about all the changes that I had to make. And I made so many changes, changes in my lifestyle, changes in uh, moving to a new city, um, uh, changes in the staffing. And, you know, it was just push, 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 you know. And at one point, I said, wow, you know, I'm at this age and I got to start all over. And you know, and I had to take a deep breath and I had to uh, encourage myself and motivate myself. And just when I said, okay, I'm going to retire for the second time, the Holy Spirit began to expand the vision. And I had to find the motivation because there comes a time when you are pushing and you are pushing and you do that. You, you, you've been doing it as, as far back as I can remember. I've been pushing and pushing and pushing the envelope, pushing the envelopes. We were talking um, with my siblings. The other, the other day, and we were looking at old clippings and, and how at the age of 10 and 11 and 12 and 9, I was always in the newspaper and, and 12 and 13 and 14 and 20 and 25, and we were looking at these old clippings, and they said to me, you know, Cindy, you've been doing this all your life, and all of a sudden, I felt exhausted. I really did. I was like, I got to go to sleep. I've been pushing since I was a little girl. But it is true. But it is, it is my purpose. And, and I think about, about, think about it because there are so many things that I have not finished, have not created. So many books I have not written. I haven't written my magnum opus as yet. And, you know, when I look at the vision, the vision is actually my motivator. You know, when, when, I, when I say, okay, I, I, what do I do next? Because directly after I finish this, I got something else, and then I got something else, and I got something else, and it goes on, and it's on, and it's on, and it's on. And, and when I want to exhale, I exhale with my vision, and it's motivating because I can see how much more I have to do. That lets me know that I'm going to live long and strong in order to do it. But you know, your, your vision is your motivator. It's a motivator. A vision is different from a dream. So we talk about keeping a dream alive. We talk about living the life of your dream, but there is a difference. A dream is given while you are asleep, and it's symbolic, and it requires requires interpretation, but a vision can be received while you're asleep or awake, but it is literal. There's no symbolism in it. 
Either you're going to do it or you're not going to do it. Either you're going to build a car. There's no symbolism in, you know, if God gives you a vision to build a car, like he did with Tesla. And it, uh, building the Tesla company. And we're going to talk to you a little bit about him and, and, in a minute how he had a vision. Visionaries are amazing because visionaries build things out of nothing. They, they really do. But a vision is different from a dream because it, it, it's, it's a download that God gives to you that requires little, very little interpretation, but what it does require is action. And that's finding the resources to do it. Look at Numbers 24, verse 4. He said, which heard the words of God, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his eyes wide open. Verse number 16, he had said, which, which heard the words of God and knew the knowledge of the Most High, which saw the vision of the Almighty, falling into a trance, but having his wise, uh, eyes wide open. So we're talking about Balaam here. Balaam, a lot of people think that Balaam was a false prophet, but he wasn't. He was just open to manipulation. And, and as a result of it, he, he, he allowed money to motivate him, and he lost his edge as a prophet. But he started out as an authentic prophet, but he had a character problem. Someone was able to buy his gift and was able to profit off of him because he was able to speak a word. And, you know, at first he pushed back, but then the price was, was set higher and then he bought into it, but he was a, a, an authentic prophet. And God would speak to him in visions, and he saw a vision of Israel. And he said, look, uh, God has blessed Israel, and I just can't curse him. And we'll, we'll pick up that story in a minute. A vision helps you to succeed. Job 33, 14 to 18 gives us the purpose of the vision. It says, for God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth on, upon man and slumberings upon bed, then he openeth the ears of man and sealeth their instructions, that he may withdraw man from his purpose and hide pride from man. He keepeth back his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. So in other words, when God gives you a vision, he, 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 your vision will prevent you from making the wrong decisions. Your vision is going to give you the ability to make the right decision, who to go with, who to have a relationship, who not to have a relationship, what to say no to, what to say yes to, what um, opportunities do you take. It is given by way of a vision. Number 10, visions are supernatural manifestations to the seriousness of something immaterial and spiritual yet to be expressed in time. So this is very important. We go back to the book of Daniel, chapter 9, verse 21. The Bible said, Yea, whilst I was speaking in prayer, even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, began, being caused to fly swiftly, touched me about the time of the evening oblation. So he said, Look, I had this open vision and I saw this angel, but I didn't, didn't think any much about it. I didn't even think it was real until the angel touched me. And then I knew, my God, that the vision are supernatural manifestation of the seriousness of something that is immaterial and spiritual yet to be manifested in time. So it was just a matter of time before the angel manifested itself. So visionaries are, are individuals that build things that are seemingly uh, out of nothing because the vision is, is the supernatural manifestation. It's going to happen. So when you have a visionary, these are people that seemingly build things out of nothing. I could talk to you about Bryn and, and Larry Page. They were entrepreneurs, and they, they, they just had an urge to leave college. They were studying. They were Ph.D. students studying at Stanford. And then they created this new thing called Google out of nothing. You have Jerry Yank and David uh, Philo. You know, again, they were in, in university, 
And then they decided, oh, let's just build something. What are we going to build? We're going to build this top search engine. And, you know, with $7 billion in revenue operating in, in, in income of $730 million. Can you imagine your operating income, $730 million? Can you imagine a church on a yearly basis that said, folks, God has given us a vision, and every year you're going to give $730 million. And you know what the church would say? All the church wants is money. We have to be able to compete in the marketplace because they put in $730 million, but they made $7 billion, and this is in 2017. But this is Yahoo, one of the greatest search engines. And so you have people like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg and Mike, Michael uh, Milken. Mike Milken was the one that, that built Tesla. I mean, T Tesla. Built Tesla. You've got these people, Oprah Winfrey and all these thought leaders that, that, that didn't have network. Oprah didn't have a network, but she built it out of nothing. And so when you are visionary, you start with what you got. And that is your vision. And your vision is powerful enough to draw every resource necessary to you. Vision is something that sparks interest in humanity. And you know, here it is in Genesis chapter 11, verse 3 to 5. Someone comes up and says, I have a vision of building a tall building that's going to touch the sky. So everybody's like, well, what's a tall building? Well, I saw a vision, so we're going to have to use bricks. Well, what's bricks? Nobody had a brick. There was never a brick. But because he had a vision, they figured out how to make bricks. The Bible said they made it out of slime and, and, and stone, and, and, and they had for mortar. So they mixed it together. They created this brick, and they built a city and a tower. The Bible said whose top, whose top may reach heaven. And they started to do that. And it's interesting because a lot of us don't understand. It was right here that God said, let us scatter them because whatever they imagine they're going to be able to do. And this is vision. Vision harnesses your imagination. So vision is the discipline of the imagination. It's, it's, it's you being able to capture the thoughts of God as an image. So you see, you don't speak in words, you speak, you, you, excuse me, you don't think in words, you think in images, and your words describe the images. It's just like if it was a hot day in L.A., you know, and, and I describe this all the time, but I, I have this ice cream place right around the corner from my house, not too far, but you have to drive through the bushes. You know, everything in Georgia is bush. So you got to drive through these beautiful greenery, and then up pops this white building with these two red um, cherries on the top. It's called Brewster's, and it pops up out of nowhere. In Georgia, you have buildings that pop up out of nowhere. I'm telling you, you'll be driving in the bush, driving in the bush, and all of a sudden, boom, a building. Are you with me? So this building pops out, and it's white. And this is where every now and then when I want an ice cream, I go down and I love vanilla. And on a hot day, that vanilla ice cream starts just dripping on your hand, and you got to lick it real fast, but it's so refreshing. Let me ask you something. Did you see words or did you see an image? So that's what a vision is. When God speaks to you, you're going to receive what he's saying in an image. And this is why you've got to discipline your mind. Visions give us clear reference points and a measuring rod for success and prosperity according to kingdom standard. First Chronicles 17 and 15 says, according to all the words and according to all this vision, so did Nathan speak Unto, day, unto David. So you see, he receives a vision, and then he speaks unto David. God gave him an image. A vision brings clarity to your call. So a lot of us have callings, but we're not too sure what God is calling us to do and when he's calling us to do it and where he's calling us to do it. And the same thing with our career, when, where, how. When am I going to start? But when God gives you a vision, it brings clarity to your call. Acts chapter 16, 9 to 10. The Bible said, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia, 
and prayed him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us forth to preach the gospel unto them. He knew he had to go to Macedonia because he had a vision. So a vision is going to dictate to where you go, when you go, who you go with. This is why you have to have a vision. And again, to remind you, in chapter 8, it's going to give you the 12 areas that you've got to write a vision in. Vision brings strength. It brings creativity, fortification to those that are called to bring it to pass. Again, in Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 to 9, that this vision, they're going to build this building. And God said, that, you know, in verse number six, behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they began to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. So if you have a vision, it is because you have a disciplined imagination. You don't want to be, you know, the, 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 the uh, individual that the song that says it's just my imagination running away. No, that's not my imagination. That's a vision that God is given for me for my life. Now, when it comes to vision, a vision is a spiritual compass that gives a person direction for their lives and a nation a direction for his people. So God spoke to Jeremiah and said, see, Jeremiah, I, I, I am calling you this day and I'm setting you over nations and over kingdoms to root out, to pull down, destroy, throw down, and to build and plant. This is Jeremiah chapter 1 where God visits him and in verse number 10, he shows shows him a vision and he says, this is the breath of your influence. This is what you're going to accomplish. And you're going to throw down and you're going to build, you're going to plant. And the Bible says this, that a lot of our visions are coming from the inspiration of God himself. Job 32, verse 8 to 9, and Job 33, 14 to 18. If you would go there with me, please. And I recognize that I'm talking really, really fast, but I really want you to get this. The scripture says, but there is a spirit in man, and the inspiration of the almighty God giveth them understanding. Great men are not always wise, neither do the age understand judgment. For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth unto man, in slumberings upon the bed, then he opens the ears of man and sealeth their instruction, that he may withdraw man from uh, his purpose or cause man not to go wrong. Because there's a way that seemed right unto man, but the end thereof is judgment. And so God wants to keep you back from making the wrong decisions. But he's going to do that by giving you a blueprint called the vision. And that vision is going to be your spiritual compass or your GPS. And it's going to keep you pointed north. Now... When it comes to the whole idea of appointing north, God will give you prophetic words and he will give you an understanding of how to uh, direct your sons and your daughters because a vision is given prophetically so that, so that you can uh, tap into the hidden potential that lies within you or lies within your children. You're able to speak that word. You're able to activate it, and you're able to give understanding. Now, when, it, when that happens, I think of Jacob, Jacob, 40, uh, Jacob in the book of Genesis 49, where he speaks to his son. God gives him divine uh, insight into the future destinies. He's able to activate them prophetically. He's able to point them to the right field, the right industry, the right profession that God had chosen for them to dominate, to prosper and succeed. So this vision is not just for you. The vision could be for your children, for your marriage, what God is going to do with you and your husband. You know, you want to have a vision. And again, in this book, Hallow Tomorrow, we're going to walk you through all the steps that is necessary. We're going to give you even a greater understanding of how to take uh, your pen and piece of paper, or your iPad, your notepad, your laptop, your, 
your 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 uh, MacBook Pro or whatever you're using, and how to write it so that you can be one that impacts nations. You don't have to just have a vision for yourself. You want God to enlarge your territory for you to begin to think bigger, think beyond you, think beyond your children, think beyond your ministry. Let, let's just ask God, give me a vision for my industry. That's my prayer. I'm prevailing in prayer. Give me a vision for my industry. What is my next? And as God gives it to me, I write it. It's a discipline. And so then every August, I begin to write the goals and objectives for the next year. I begin to check them off. So by October, November, at the absolute latest, I know the goals. What I'm doing in January, February, March, April, May, I'm able to check them off. I'm able to succeed based on time frames. And it's not keeping up with anybody. I don't care what other people are doing other than the fact that I'm called to intercede for them, but I'm not called to peer into or behind the veil to figure out what they're doing so I could duplicate or keep up with them. That is not my position. My position is to mind my own business and try to figure out how, what role am I playing in the unfolding of God's plan for man. Let's give you a few more. More than one vision brings conflict. So when you're in a corporate setting, when you're in a ministry, when you're in a business, you've got to be able to find out what is the vision of this business and ministry and stick to that. If not, you will be an instrument of confusion and conflict and eventually it will begin to it will begin to be sabotaged from within. Vision brings direction to your life. Acts chapter 10, 9 to 13, it brings direction to your life. This is what happened to Peter. Peter didn't want to have anything to do with the Samaritans, but God gave him a vision, and through that vision, he understood that a part of his assignment was to open the door to the kingdom, to the church, to uh, the gospel, to the Samaritans, um, and it was, it was his responsibility to do it and not to keep all of that information to himself. Now, in order to ensure the successful realization of your vision, this is number 17, it's got to be written down. And we spent a number of, uh, um, uh, uh, t uh, a lot of time talking about Habakkuk chapter 2, verses 2 to 3. And we gave you an ac uh, and extrapolated the 20 principles for writing the vision from there. Every vision has a designated time for it to manifest, and you should be aware of that designated time. Number 18, visions are given to anointed and yielded vessels. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Number 19, we have to handle our visions in a responsible way matter. We've got to handle it in a responsible manner. If God gives it to us, then we have to observe protocol. We have to bring order into our lives, discipline into our lives. We have to, we have to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, um, uh, not only to bring discipline in, into our lives, but to refine our spirit so that we are representatives of the kingdom of heaven. Number 20, visions ha a vision has the power to separate people one from another. And we see it in Daniel chapter 10. We see that although they were in the same place, they were not in the same position or spiritual space to receive what Daniel had received. And therefore, they, they walked away. They left because they were not in the same space. They may, be, may have been in the same place, but not the same space. And people that are not in the same spiritual space or the spiritual location as you, eventually your vision is either going to drive them away or cause them to change. And they would, be, they would have to adjust based on the vision that God has given you. Number 21, a vision can be overwhelming. This is what happened to Daniel in Daniel chapter 10, verses 8 to 10. It overwhelmed him. He said, I fell into a deep sleep on my face. In other words, he was slain. And sometimes when God gives you a revelation, you come out of it and, 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 and God has to wait for you to exhale, exhale, exhale because it's so overwhelming. You know, God, you want me to do what, with what, where, when, how? Do you realize who I am? When, when David got the revelation that God had called him to, to, to serve Saul, he said, who am I and what is my family? that I should be father-in-law of the king. What are you talking about? You are a son-in-law of the king. You're not just the son-in-law of the king. You are a king. 
So there was nothing in him that could connect to his destiny until God processed him. And there were many things that God will give you. And you, you say, God, I don't know how I'm going to do this. Do you realize where I came from? Do you realize who my daddy is, my mama is? Do you realize I don't have a degree? Do you realize I don't have the money? I hope you do realize. I just want to give you a heads up. And God is going to say, I know everything about you. You don't have to present to me what you don't have and who you don't have and what, you know, what university. I'm giving you the vision because I can trust you with that vision. Number 22, visions require divine interpretation. And this is what happened to Daniel. Uh, Gabriel had to come to give him an understanding of the vision. Daniel chapter 8, verse 15 to 17. It says, and it came to pass when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and saw it for the meaning. Then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the, the, the banks of Ulay, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was afraid, and I fell on my face. But he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for at, at the time of the end shall be this vision. This is amazing. A vision is going to summon angels to your, your side. You're going to have angelic visitation. You're going to have angelic support. You're going to have angelic under, uh, undergirding. You're going to have this angelic uh, 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 activities all around you. And God is going to use these angels to propel you, to undergird you, and give you an understanding of what he's speaking to you. Number 23, all leaders are visionaries, but not all visionaries are leaders. All leaders are visionaries, but not all visionaries are leaders. So you don't need to be in a leadership position for you to be a visionary. You don't have to be the uh, senior vice president or the president. You don't need to be the chairman of the board. You don't need to be a supervisor. You could be an entry-level clerk, and God still use you in visions. Number 24, visions must be clearly communicated. This is what happened with Moses and Solomon. They clearly communicated, and as a result of that, they were able to build these magnificent places of worship because they communicated the vision. And then finally, number 25, a vision must be mature before it is revealed to others. Because you have people that will discourage you, people that would sabotage you, people that would compete with you, people that would undermine you, people that would start a smear campaign. So you're, let your vision be matured and at least start bringing that vision to pass before you are able to share it with most people. Some people you can. Your inner circle of trust, you can share it with those people. But with most people, you keep it dear to your heart and keep it between you and God until it's fully written out, until you begin to bring that vision to, to pass, until you are unstoppable. Daniel 8, 26 to 27, and the vision of the evening and the morning, which was told is true. Wherefore, shut thou up the vision, for it shall be for many days. And I, Daniel, fainted and was sick certain days. Afterwards, I rose up and did the king's business, and, and I was astonished at the vision, but none understood. There were things that God wants to do for you and in you. And some of the things you've got to hold to your chest. But one of the things you do want to do at the end of the day, you want to understand that God is a God of revelation. He has great plans for your life, but he also has great plans for your marriage. He has great plans for your family. He has great plans for your ministry. He has great plans for your community. He has great plans for your nations. Don't be restricted when writing your vision. Don't be small thinkers. Ask God, make me a visionary in this generation until the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ until your original plan and purpose for humanity is manifested. Make me a part of the unfolding of that plan. And at the end of the day, you will get the glory as we push humanity forward. In the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Ghost, it shall not be by your might, 
nor by your power, but it shall be by the Spirit of the Lord. God bless you all. We pray that this really helped you and brought a clearer understanding of vision so that you can say goodbye to yesterday and to be able to say hello tomorrow. God bless you. Amen. And with that, you have completed this exclusive teaching series, Hello Tomorrow. We hope that you've enjoyed yourself. And hey, if it's really impacted your life, I dare you to go back online and order one, two, three more copies and give them out as gifts to those that are closest to you who haven't already bought, bought it themselves. And, and I also encourage you to stay on the journey with us. We want to see you at one of our events, whether Kingdom School of Ministry, Injury You're Strong, or you can come to our local Bible study here in Atlanta. Just visit cindytrimministries.org and go to the events section. And we'll see you then. And, 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 and also watch every first and third Thursday where we stream all of our latest sermons and teachings as well from the app. God bless you, and, and we'll see you in the next teaching series. Yeah.